This video is sponsored by Brilliant. More on that later. Hi, I'm Griffin Johnson, the Armchair Historian. Today's video, was the Prussian army really as good as that one kid who wears a pickle hob to school thinks it was? During the 18th century, the Kingdom of Prussia became renowned for its almost legendary military. However, as with anything in history, there's often exaggeration and misinterpretation. Today we'll be examining whether the Prussian army's reputation as one of the most effective fighting forces in all of European history is well deserved or merely the product of popular imagination. To assist us in answering this question, we will be examining three aspects of the Prussian army, structure, tactics, and military successes. Let's start with structure, namely the Prussian command system under the leadership of Frederick William I, the Soldier King. Frederick's first course of action as King of Prussia was dismissing the majority of his court from the previous ruler and inviting numerous military reformers. Frederick recognized that a large army needed competent officers, and in 1716 he founded Prussia's first cadet school, the Kadettenhaus. The cadet training program was open to only members of the Prussian nobility at the time, also known as the Junkers. This meant that while Prussian leaders had adequate training, their positions were not always earned with merit but with status. Officers are nothing without men to lead, and so in 1733 Frederick William I turned his attention by introducing the Canton Conscription System, in which Prussia was divided into small regions containing about 5,000 households each. Every able-bodied male was added to a list of potential recruits, and soon this meant that Prussia would have the fourth largest army in Europe. While this allowed the Prussians to count themselves as one of the major military powers on the continent, they still had not developed a reputation for discipline and tactical innovation. Still, when compared to the armies of France and Austria, where the service of enlisted men was voluntary and commissions were mostly purchased, we can easily say that the Prussian system was remarkably efficient. The next task of the Soldier King was to make the Prussian army as disciplined and effective as possible. There were three most visible innovations implemented under Frederick rule. We'll start with the first, the Iron Ramrod. The first question some of you may be asking is, how could an iron ramrod increase battlefield efficiency? The simple answer is that, as opposed to the wooden ramrod, the iron ramrod didn't break in battle, something which otherwise would happen frequently. As for the second innovation, whereas other nations generally trained their men to fire a maximum of three rounds per minute, the soldiers of Frederick William's army were relentlessly drilled to fire up to six shots per minute, which was an unheard of number at the time. And although this rate of fire was impossible to achieve during the chaos of battle, and in fact could barely be achieved on the parade ground, it did ensure that the Prussians would be firing at a greater volume than their opponents, even if it was only one shot more. The third and most iconic innovation of the Prussian army was the goose step, a marching style that at first glance looks comical, but proved to be highly advantageous on the 18th and 19th century battlefield. Introduced by the great reformer Prince Leopold of Anhalt Dessau in the 1740s, it was intended to keep soldiers marching at the same pace in battle, making it easier for commanders to maneuver and maintain control of their armies. By contrast, the marching orders of other European armies made their formations liable to dissolve in combat. Prussian military innovations didn't stop there, and the cavalry arm of the Prussian army excelled in its role as a shock force and was noted for its aggressiveness, as can be seen with the Death's Head or Totenkopf Hussars. Considering all of these points, it is apparent that the Prussian army excelled in its use of tactics. The development of tactics means nothing unless they can be implemented correctly on the battlefield, a skill which requires a great general. For the Prussians, theirs would be the successor of the Soldier King, none other than Frederick the Great. Frederick inherited, in the words of Tim Blanning, author of Frederick the Great, King of Prussia, a large, well-equipped, and well-trained army, a loyal nobility accustomed to serve, an efficient administration, and a budget large enough to allow a war to be waged without additional taxation or loans. 
Frederick personally commanded the army at many battles, and for our purposes we'll be examining his three greatest victories, Hohenfriedberg, Rosbach, and Leuten. The latter two of these battles contain examples of the Prussians using the advanced tactics we've previously discussed, while the former can be used to demonstrate the efficacy of the Prussian cavalry. The Battle of Hohenfriedberg, fought during the Second Silesian War against Austria, was Frederick's first major victory, one which would earn him the moniker which we still use when referring to him today. During this confrontation, a force of around 59,000 Prussians defeated a combined Austro-Saxon force of about 63,000 men. The battle is mostly remembered for its conclusion, in which a single regiment of Prussian heavy cavalry rounded most of the enemy's lines, capturing over 2,000 prisoners. Six months after this decisive victory, the Prussians and Austrians signed a peace treaty that ensured Prussia would have control of Silesia. The next great victory was the Battle of Rosbach, fought during the Seven Years' War. This battle only lasted an hour and a half, and more notably, it was won by a Prussian force of 22,000 against an Austro-French force of 42,000. Frederick was able to execute a series of complex maneuvers that required his troops to march in total unison with one another, something achieved with the iconic goose step. Frederick was then able to outflank his enemies using a tactic known as Oblique Order, applying pressure with well-disciplined volleys on the enemy's flank and crushing them with a final cavalry charge. The final great victory we will mention today occurred exactly one month after the Battle of Rosbach, near the Silesian village of Leuten. Employing many of the same tactics that he used in the previous battle, Frederick's army of 33,000 decisively defeated an Austrian force yet again. The battle is notable for featuring one of the greatest displays of Prussian discipline in the entire Seven Years' War, in which two lines of Prussian grenadiers marched perfectly spaced against the Austrians. The outcome of the battle ensured that Austria would be unable to participate in the rest of the Seven Years' War, thereby securing Prussian victory. We can then conclude from these battles that Frederick the Great's reputation is well deserved. However, it should be understood that Frederick's military reforms were not perfect. In particular, artillery was the branch of the Prussian military that was never used to its full potential. Frederick did recognize this later on in his military career and was one of the first leaders to adopt horse artillery, but the cultivation of Prussian artillery would be overshadowed later on by a young Corsican lieutenant. After the death of Frederick in 1786, his army began to decline into decadence and mediocrity for the remainder of the century. The shock of the Prussian defeat at Jena in 1806 at the hands of Napoleon inspired the military establishment to undertake a series of comprehensive reforms. Under the leadership of General Gerhard von Scharnhorst, the Prussian army opened the officer corps to the middle class, which by 1830 allowed Prussia to again become a formidable military power. Further reform Reforms to strategy and doctrine occurred under the renowned Helmut von Moltke, who emphasized initiative and rapid movement. All of these reforms allowed the Prussians to crush the Danes in 1864, the Austrians in 1866, and the French in 1870, which paved way for German unification in 1871. In order to fund his armies, Frederick Wilhelm I shut down the Prussian Academy of Sciences, allowing educational institutions in Britain and France to surpass it. But when Frederick the Great came to power, the academy was opened once more. Many of its students, including Jean d'Alembert and Pierre Maupatouille, studied mathematics and went on to make very important contributions to the field. Today you can learn more about d'Alembert's formula for solving the wave equation and Maupatouille's principle of least action by using brilliant which offers simple yet effective ways to challenge and better your mathematical abilities. I want to give a huge thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring today's episode. Their contribution allows us to continue improving the quality of our content, so please support us on our channel by using the link in the description below by going to brilliant.org slash armchairhistorian. It's free to try out, and the first 200 users to register with the link in the description below will get 20% off of their annual premium subscription. Thanks for watching. I'd like to thank the Armchair Historian team and my general staff on Patreon. If you're interested in Prussian history, be sure to check out our playlist on German history. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time, next week.